Liberalism has gone back uh, a fair way, as we all know, and we sometimes forget that uh, it all grew out of the Civil War and that John Locke wrote on salvation because of the pressure for everyone to conform and his uh, argument that non-conformity was an important right uh, that had to be uh, supported against an authoritarian government. Uh, so the tradition of liberalism have grown an awful lot and added an awful lot. And we're going to hear a lot from that uh, this evening. And here is the book, which we hope you will all uh, buy at least three copies of, Duncan Bradford sign uh, all of them. Uh, and uh, we now have four uh, contributors and speakers uh, to introduce it. And first of all, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Barker, my colleague in the House of Lords, who's our spokesman now in the voluntary sector uh, and uh, LBGT, to talk about gender. And of course, before I do that, I should have remarked that I'm uh, William Wallace, I'm also a spokesman in the Lords, and I'm probably one of the older people here, so I can uh, remember back further than most of you, I was assistant press officer in the 1966 election, and I have written quite a lot under the pen name of Joe Grumman. <laughs> Good. Uh, thank you very much. Whenever I come to uh, these events, I, I'm uh, always hit by uh, a, a feeling of, of panic. I, I say that. Uh, I come from a family that is littered with history teachers and lecturers, and, and I scraped an O-level. Uh, I was much better at geography, which my family refers to as colouring in. <laughs> <laughs> and when Duncan said to me, would you write this, this, this piece about what have liberals have done on, on gender equality, I approached it with all the bravado that I do. I said, oh, yes. <laughs> and then thought, why, why did I agree <laughs> to, to do this? Uh, and I'm really glad that I did. Uh, uh, and I'm really glad that I did for a couple of reasons. What Number one, I discovered a couple of historical things along, along the way that I, I did not know, which I'll come to. Uh, but secondly, I, it has uh, come home to me uh, in doing this piece of work, just how enduring the principles uh, and lessons of liberalism and the binding thoughts of liberalism are. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to be using them uh, in some work that I'm going to be doing uh, coming up. I was asked to talk about gender equality. <clears throat> and I suppose my starting point I went back to uh, was Mary Wollstonecraft and her Vindication of the Rights of Women of 1792, uh, a piece of work um, which was based on the firm belief that women should be educated and they should be educated just as much as men should be educated. And um, it was a direct uh, challenge to Rousseau's advice that women should not uh, be educated. One word, Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. yeah. Afghanistan and the crime so that are being done to women and girls in Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, so that was one, uh, one point. Um, and it, it is undoubtedly true that that body of work, the Wellston Crown, and the ideas that she put forward went on to influence uh, a generation of liberal thinkers. And uh, the most public of them were, of course, all men. The role of women in public life at that time was very much a uh, uh, circumspect. And so we move forward to perhaps uh, the, the next most obvious uh, place to land, and that is uh, John Stuart Mill and, and Harriet Taylor. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to tell you what I've written. I want you to go and read it. But I, I come back to that every uh, so often, because there is a brilliant artwork uh, which is uh, at the uh, end of St. Stephen's Hall, which is uh, the, the end of uh, Westminster Hall going into St. Stephen's Hall, which is called A New Dawn. It's a fantastic, mm -hmm. there's no other reason to go to, to, to Westminster. Go and see this artwork. It's wonderful. Uh, it's very modern and it's put up to commemorate the anniversary of John Stuart Mill's presentation of the first petition uh, for women to have, uh, have the vote. This whole series of lights that come on uh, in sequences. And the, the light is always in the middle of yellow. And I, everybody walked away from it. And I was like, yes, we, we were there at the beginning of what was then a revolutionary uh, uh, thing to do, which was to demand 
legal equality uh, for women. Um, I, in this audience, I don't really need to go through on, on liberty. I really don't. Uh, I do need to tell you that, um, just that for those of you who don't know that Harriet Taylor, uh, not so much written about uh, as was a profound effect, had a profound effect upon, uh, a, a, upon, uh, upon Mill. Uh, he credits her, I think perhaps he over credits her with her influence on, uh, on his work. But she did come up with one of the greatest like, you know, concerning then the fitness of women for politics, that is not the question. The question is the fitness of politics for women. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, I think, uh, is a great place on which, a great phrase on which liberals should, uh, should fit. Um, I want just to, 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 to flick, I mean, to go through the, we all know that the, 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 the representation of women in parliament, Beck's question of what happened with the suffragists and the suffragettes, is one that we, deserves a whole uh, meeting in its uh, in its own right. But what I will tell you, in the course of doing this piece of work, I turned up the fact that um, in the late 1890s, uh, such was the uh, lack of representation of women, that there was a huge amount of work went into, uh, and then uh, pushing for women to be able to, to be represented in local government. And in fact, there came a point at which two liberal women were elected to the London County Council and were promptly thrown off the technical court and thrown off by the Tories. And people thought the injustice of that propelled <coughs> forward uh, legislation enabling women to stand in local government. And of six uh, women mayors, um, a number of them uh, were women, including one that I knew nothing about, one called Sarah Lees, who was the mayor of Oldham and who is uh, his subject of a statue in a park that I've known about all of my life because I live just the other side of town, but I have never been to see. So there's a, one of these days we'll get down, we'll get round to doing a proper history of liberal women in local government. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot that we can yeah. say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because the women liberal, the women, women liberal association, while we were represented in Parliament, were actually out doing a load of campaigning work, uh, campaigning work to get Re liberal representation of men, but also a lot of work on 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 social and political issues uh, around the country. I haven't got much time, so I've got I've got to race through uh, <laughs> to uh, the person who is the reason why I uh, probably why I joined the party, and that's David and the sixty seven abortion act. Um, David, I think, um, reflected um, the, actually reflected uh, the guilt of a lot of men. Of the position of women uh, at that time, uh, and I think that his was a, a absolutely worldly landmark piece of legislation. I know uh, David Steele, for those who've only just joined. Yeah, yeah I'm so old. And, <laughs> I I that I know that that had a that piece of legislation had a profound effect on people on liberals around the world. Jeremy Purvis told me that when he accompanied David on a uh, a meeting to uh, uh, to Washington. Madeleine Albright so talked about the fact that she used to get the Hansards of the debates on that act in Parliament, and she used to read them. And and I don't think she was alone. I think women around the world looked at that piece of legislation mm -hmm. and saw something quite tremendous. He got it through because of the work of another liberal who was not technically a liberal at the time. But that was Roy Jenkins, and to go back and read the whole, the whole of what Roy Jenkins did in that administration at that time, and the social how he got that tra transformative social policy agenda through is again another really interesting mm -hmm. part of it. I want to I want to come back and land on um, same sex marriage uh, again. Go and read Lynn Featherston's book and find out most of the story of of why that happened. Um, uh, but it, the fact that it did happen, I'll just give you one little snippet that you will not find written anywhere. Um, there was one night when there was a bunch of uh, my colleagues and we were talking to I think, Tom McNay when this legislation was coming before him. And a number of my colleagues were going and saying, well, is this equal marriage? Is it taking it? And, and Tom McNay just sat there and said, it doesn't matter. This is a symbolic piece of legislation. And it's about justice, and it's about families, and it means that a mum can stand up and say, "I went to my son's wedding, and I went to my daughter's wedding," 
And that is a profound thing. And I want to end up by saying one, why I think this, all of this is important. It, we have always, as liberals, worked in the tough space of defending people who are unpopular mm -hmm. and minorities. Mm -hmm. And we do that yeah, yeah. because that is our purpose. We are going to find it extremely difficult over the next year and a half, two years, to do that. Uh, because a spent Tory party mm -hmm. is going to be more reliant on ever than on ever before uh, on a particular thing. There is a, we now are beginning to find out, uh, a well-funded, highly organised campaign at its heart. It is uh, initiated and funded by Christian nationalists in uh, America and Russia, uh, to a certain extent, backed up by Chinese influence. And they, um, their purpose, their overall purpose, is to destroy human rights legislation and the mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, and the international organisations which support it. Mm -hmm. They have five chosen uh, tactical places, uh, uh, grounds on which they hope to fight: uh, anti-abortion, anti-LGBT stuff, anti-RSE, uh, anti-surrogacy, uh, and, um, and also assisted dying. And what they are very cleverly doing this time around is rather than fighting those battles themselves, they've got a load of proxies in. So they're managing to pit mm -hmm. uh, feminists against trans people and uh, different people, in, and they're going on different uh, different parts of these agendas, different things. But it is all an organised thing. It's wrapped up, you know, wrapped up in terms of wokery. It is the absolute, all of it is the absolute antithesis of liberalism and what we have worked for, for particularly in the last 50 years. So go back, read these documents about how in times past people did the really difficult job of making liberal values a reality and a reality for minorities and for everybody and think about how you're going to do that over the next 10 years. Thank you very much, Linda. And now we're going to Wendy Chamberlain, who's the MP for North East Fife. Uh, chief whip in the commons and also our spokesman on pensions and welfare and someone who i've thoroughly enjoyed working with in the last two years when thank you uh, very much uh, Ronan. it's a real pleasure to be here and for those of you who've potentially seen me chair a lived in history group meeting since i've become uh, since i was elected obviously uh, online will know that i've told the story that this was the first um, group that i joined um, when i attended my first federal conference back in spring 2016. Um, so since then I've chaired a couple of meetings, but to actually be on the panel this evening is, is pretty good because I'm sorry to say, Liz, I come from a, a family of, of, of history uh, geeks. In fact, uh, my new step-granddaughter was born a fortnight ago today, and uh, we took my husband and I great pleasure in telling uh, my stepdaughter and her husband that uh, their daughter was born on the 510th anniversary of the Battle of Flodden. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you don't know, didn't go particularly well for the Scots. Um, so, so I am history, and um, I, I think I'm not sure. And, and maybe those there here will collect me. I can't remember if it was because this is only my third ever federal conference. So, being here as an MP is, is a deeply uh, strange experience. But I did attend. Um, a, it was either Brighton or Bournemouth. And it was a discussion about uh, the welfare state. And on the back of that, I bought Chris Reddick's book, who was one of the speakers that night, uh, Bread for All the Origins of the Welfare uh, State. And uh, and I bought it because I was fascinated. Maybe, maybe people knew that I was going to end up doing uh, the Department of Work and Pensions. But one of the comments on the back of it, and it's actually Dominic Sandbrook of um, The Rest is History. Yeah, I, I listened to that as well. Um, uh, who said, you know, Rennick shows that the key period was the turn of the 20th century in relation to the welfare state, as opposed to the fact that it's associated uh, with the 1940s for many. And obviously that was that was when the Liberals uh, were in power. And that's why I'm really pleased and, and thank you to Malcolm uh, for his chapter, because I think the book has, and the chapter has uh, captured the fact that it was actually um, us at the start of the 20th century that really did lay the foundations of the welfare state. But I think also we shouldn't, and, the book, uh, and again, the chapter doesn't uh, take away from that, the fact that there were uh, movements uh, during the 19th century as well, when the poor laws were seen as increasingly uh, fit for purpose. We saw the rise in um, uh, populations in towns and cities beyond potentially where uh, the rural poor had been uh, previously. And very strongly, I think the chapter uh, outlines how that free trade stance of liberals led into uh, the work in relation to um, 
to, to the, the, the welfare uh, state. Now, the 1906 election, obviously, um, none of us here remember, but obviously that was the biggest um, sort of majority uh, for, for the Liberals. And the one person who didn't mention was asking about Asquith. And I, have mm -hmm. to, I did say this at the stall earlier, but um, I did over the summer read uh, Roy Jenkins' Asquith. I borrowed it from House of Commons Library. It was the first book I borrowed from the library. I went along and said, how did they do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and um, for those from a North East Fife perspective, uh, what was quite interesting was I'm from Greenock in the west coast of Scotland. So some of you might be aware that Ming Campbell, my mm -hmm. predecessor in North East Fife, uh, also stood as a candidate in Greenock. Mm -hmm. And I discovered from reading uh, Jenkins' book that Asquith actually gave his farewell speech as leader of the Liberals after losing the Poole of Paisley in the 1920 election in Greenock. So it feels like it was absolutely fated for me to be North East Vice um, MP. But yes, when we look at Lloyd George, uh, that was obviously under an, As an Asquith uh, uh, government. When we look at what happened, we look at introducing uh, uh, pensions, uh, sickness, all those things that kind of when we're having discussions around the welfare state today, despite the cuts uh, that the Conservatives have made to it, there are definitely some shibboleths that, uh, that, that, that people don't go, go near because we recognise as a society, and I think it's a sign of, of both a liberal society but an advanced society, that we need to put a safety net in place for the most vulnerable. And what's obviously interesting for Sarah, uh, Leila and I, and um, you know, having been elected in 2019 and COVID coming, is that for many people had never come into contact with the welfare system before, but did so for the first time during COVID and found that there was a lot in, of holes in, in the support. The chapter goes on to talk about the Yellow Book and the beverage support uh, report. I think we can take a lot of credit again from that, uh, given uh, beverages uh, background. And then I think it's great that we've got a bit of a mention of the coalition government, because I have to say, I couldn't be doing the role I do as pension spokesperson, as well as chief whip, as well as deputy leader in Scotland, <laughs> as well as a member of FPECTA mm -hmm. and FCC. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it without the help of Steve Webb, who is obviously in a professional capacity now, still heavily involved in pensions and does a lot of, basically, he's very good at the fine detail and saying, Wendy, you should, you should ask some questions about that. Now, he engages with all the parties in his role, but I certainly think he's, he's been quite help, uh, you know, helpful in that regard. I mean, here's an example for you, which I think will play quite well in a blue, blue wall seat. It is the fact that uh, if uh, you if you think about a uh, child benefit, and we know that that has been now, if you earn uh, mm. a joint income of, of over eighty thousand pounds or sixty thousand pounds as a sing uh, a, a, a single uh, person in the house, uh, you no longer qualify for a child uh, benefit payment. What a lot of people don't know is that if you do not apply for that benefit, even if you don't qualify for it. The person staying at home, which is usually uh, uh, the woman, usually the mother, doesn't then qualify for a national insurance credits. Mm. So in the future, potentially has lost uh, income from uh, their pension. Mm. And but why would somebody apply for something that they know that they're not entitled to? Mm. So these are the things where Steve is incredibly, incredibly helpful. And I think for me, one of the reasons why I am a history uh, geek and why I love it is because when you look back. You can take the lessons uh, forward and i think about and i see a couple of people in the room who were involved in the ubi or the fair society working paper a uh, group that i was in, involved in in, in uh, 18 months uh, two years ago and where we were looking at how we might implement a universal basic income policy and we were looking at the huge costs that we involved the principles uh, that would be involved and how we could we best deliver it and i actually came back to old age pensions and the fact that lloyd george didn't start with giving everybody an old age pension. It was how do we get support to the most needy in the first instance and extend from there. And I think that's where I certainly ended up in, in that working group because my role really was to try and bring the politics to, to the proposals and um, that, that we came up with. And I just want to finish just to say that there is so much uh, more to do. Uh, Liz was talking about the sort of erosion of rights. And I remember very powerfully the sort of uh, women's march in the states just after Trump was elected mm -hmm. and a woman about my mother's age uh, with a sign that says I can't believe I'm having to march for this shit again <laughs> <laughs> and and that is the reality that everything that we take as as liberals uh, as 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 for granted we've achieved that we've delivered that 
we absolutely can't take it for granted. All of us here are in this room because we firmly believe that we can. That's why we've joined the Liberal Democrats and, and we campaign. But I had a meeting just a couple of weeks ago with Baroness Stroud, who is um, involved in the cross party or chairing the cross party poverty strategy commission. Now they've just done an interim report, which you can look at, but just the top headlines of that, it's identified a missing 36 billion in resources needed to eradicate poverty in the UK. The reality is that poverty rates remain stubbornly high at between 21 and 24 percent of the population and that has not really shifted since the early 2000s. I'm sure we can all think of reasons for that. One in three children are still living in poverty and nearly one in ten people, seven percent, live in deep poverty. And the Commission is saying that poverty in the UK is a whole society issue and must be underpinned by a comprehensive, sustainable and fair uh, social uh, contract. Now, what the Commission is saying is that insufficiency of income is not the only reason for poverty, but I think that I firmly believe in my role as DWP spokesperson that an insufficiency of income is a big reason why so many people are in poverty. And, and it's an insufficiency of income where we've seen, uh, you know, um, freezes to um, benefit levels. We've seen a lack of support. That was one of the worst things for me during uh, the pandemic, where uh, those who were on legacy benefits did not get the £20 uplift that universal credit payments did, simply because the IT systems could not have coped with delivering that level of support to legacy benefits and nothing was done uh, over uh, that period. And we know that those on legacy benefits are disabled people, those people that actually need more help, uh, not less. And my final thing, the other thing I do in addition to my DWP role is I co-chair the APPG for food bank, ending the need for food banks. You know, one constituent writes me to say, you don't want to close the food bank in Cooper Lindsay. You know, it does so much good. I was saying, ending the needs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but the, the harsh fact is that the one time that food bank use decreased in the UK since 2015 is when the twenty pound uplift for universal credit was in place. You know, people were use it, not using food banks because they had a sufficiency of income with the support from the increase in universal credit. And that's why, as Liberals, we need to defend the welfare state against any attack, and we need to see what else we can do uh, to support. And I think this book and Malcolm's chapter does a good job in a short period of uh, space of uh, space to uh, demonstrate why the Liberals were at the centre and the foundation of the welfare state. So thank you. Men and Brands going to talk about the international dimension of the liberal tradition. No one better than, than Leila, who, as you know, uh, had, had a very international, I'm bringing her father as a European diplomat, her mother is Palestinian, and represents a very international constituency. I, I happened to be in her constituency in St. Angeles last weekend in, in a, a, a reunion of people we talked 30 years ago, yeah. who included the president of Iceland, the Portuguese foreign minister. <laughs> and one, of my most, one of my most painful memories is agreeing to come and talk in your constituency, <laughs> and, and, and arriving to talk about liberal attitudes to foreign policy. And there was a diplomatic correspondent of the Financial Times, <laughs> three Oxford professors who knew much more about their subject than I did. And I thought, what on earth am I doing here? So, uh, you have to be international to be the uh, MP for Oxford West and Africa. I mean, you do it extremely well, you're going to talk about it. <laughs> um, I don't say I feel a bit like that now. What am I doing? <laughs> um, and because, not least because it's Duncan who wrote the chapter, and you're quite the expert yourself. So I feel like I'm having a fiver in front of you. <laughs> um, and uh, yes, I have my fair share of Oxfords. But uh, unlike uh, Wendy, I, I do not have a history background at all. I am a physics teacher, maths teacher. I lean into the numbers. I gave up history at the first possible opportunity. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's boring. But of course, of course, and the reason why I engage with the, uh, this group is because, I mean, I do find it endlessly fascinating because I come from a, a knowledge base of zero. Um, but also to recognize that we do, in our tradition, stand on the shoulders of giants and mm -hmm. the things that we grapple with in our roles. And I would say it's been, been quite the time to be foreign affairs spokesperson, um, not least what happened in Afghanistan and then the war uh, with Ukraine and Russia. I mean, it does feel 
like the geopolitical axis is spinning on itself at the moment. And so it's times like these where it is appropriate, I think, to look backwards in order to help guide us forwards. And so very genuinely, thank you, because I didn't know where else to be. <laughs> um, uh, but also, you know, there's some important things here and lessons for us to, to take forward, which is what I'll, I'll focus on. So the first, I think very apt, is, is on free trade. You know, free trade as a concept. So it was Adam Smith, Ricardo, who came up with the idea. And I love, and if you've got it, uh, and if you don't, you should buy it, because that's why you're here. Um, <laughs> do look on page 26, because there's the wonderful cartoon. I'm a big fan of campaigning and cartoons. Um, <laughs> but it's it's what a free trade shop looks like. It's from the Liberal Party circa 1905 to 1910. And you've got a bustling free trade shop with lots of people queuing up outside, and you've got a protectionist shop uh, with a man coming uh, telling the storekeeper to give him his rates. And this is, of course, about the Corn Laws, which is one of the major schisms in the Conservative Party. It was the Liberals who stood up against this protectionist measure. It was a long campaign, and we won. And by winning, also managed to split them, which is our team. <laughs> so yes, more of that, please. Um, but off the back of that, and this, this concept of free trade, well, it was us who very much championed that concept on an international level. And I think the role for liberals in creating that fair international order, I would highly recommend the pre-manifesto, which is coming up tomorrow, where we talk about this. Um, but remember, it was very much in our tradition to do that because we recognized that you know, unfettered free trade also had its drawbacks. Much as we were founding partners of the League of Nations and the United Nations, we knew that there were issues with all of that. And so it was incredibly important that we continued to engage, that we continued to defend, that we continue uh, to make the positive case. And it was partly that that led to the creation of the World Trade Organization, which is another one of those great institutions, international institutions that we've learned to rely on. Institutions, by the way, that Russia and China don't like terribly. And, and that probably says everything you need to know about why we need it. Um, and I love, I love this quote, um, as Gladstone put it in 1879, and I'm just reading directly, foreign policy of England should always be inspired by a love of freedom. And I, I couldn't agree more. That was the basis on which all of these institutions was founded. And it's the very reason why, you know, we have these existential threats with China Russia, and not just from there, Liz mentioned it, there are forces that are in America as well that would much rather have us have less freedom. They call it, to an extent, libertarianism, but it's it's not. It's not based in our liberal tradition, which recognizes that freedom has to be for all, no matter where you are. And I would point out that it's when we have been on that political stage that often the Liberal Democrats domestically have made big advances. So we think to, I didn't know this about the Suez adventure, um, but in 1956 under Joe Grimmond, um, we took a stance and that helped us politically. Obviously Iraq was actually why I got involved in the party in the first place. I was in my third year of university when the invasion happened. I remember Charles Kennedy on that march. It was the first march I ever went on. And that was what tuned me in to the Liberal Democrats and why I ended up being here, frankly. Um, but also, you know, the atrocities in Bosnia, Hong Kong, wherever there has been that kind of strife, the Liberal Democrats have always been on the right side of the argument pretty much from the off. And it would be remiss of me to not talk about Europe in that vein, mm. because we were also the first major political party to want to be part of the common market. And that is no surprise. You know, we continue to be at the forefront uh, of the European project. Uh, we continue still to want to push our country further towards cooperation because that is how we do politics. And it's not just a domestic thing, it's what we believe is right for the world. And on that note, and I'll end simply by perhaps drawing a little bit on, there was a friend earlier I was in uh, with Duncan where John Curtis was talking about, we need some answers to what we do about labor because now they're ahead. He was pointing out that you know they've made some strides towards 
uh, speaking about Europe, we might be losing some ground. What else is there? And I think we should take that challenge head on. And I would like to offer something from our past for our future. We should be really proud in our commitment to international aid, and in particular, the commitment to spending 0.7% of GNI on national aid. I remember it in my lifetime from that bill that passed in 2014. It was us in coalition government, a private members bill that pushed that forwards. And it, that was why the law exists in the first place. And at the moment, the government, that shameful cut that they've made to 0.5% is shameful. But by law, they at some point are meant to return to it. What I didn't appreciate was that actually we have backed this position since 1969. And that just goes to show how forward thinking we were. It also goes to show how long you have to campaign for something. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you don't have to do it that much longer to see the return of 0.7%. But the reason why we campaigned for 0.7% all the way through those decades was because we recognize that there is humanity in all of us, no matter where we are in the world. That if you're gonna tackle poverty and inequality, if you want to cooperate with people, if you wanna trade with them, the best thing you can do is to help them. International aid being the best expression of how we do that. So as we move towards the next election, let's learn those lessons from the past. Hopefully it won't take as long, but this is a very clear dividing line now between us and Labour who have basically fallen to the Tory position. They are not intending, they've said, to go back to 0.7% immediately. I think it's shame on both of them and that's why I'm proud to be here. Thank you. Sarah Oldie, as you all ought to know, is the economic and industrial spokesman for the party. She has fought, won, lost, and regained. <laughs> uh, a, a, so, you know, a veteran of some very hard fights. What I really want to ask her is where exactly the Hawker Hydro factory was in your constituency, which oh. you mentioned at lunchtime, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, what I look forward to hearing you talk about now is the evolving liberal uh, approach to economics as Britain has become industrial and then post-industrial. Thank you very much. Well, so we all seem to start with a bit of family history. So I feel, firstly, I need to point out my dad was born in Greenock. So <laughs> and he was a maths teacher. So you know, <laughs> our parents' like interest in academic subjects is informing our current role. <laughs> really, uh, clearly, I'm, I'm, I'm doing well. So, um, but just to answer your question, the clue is uh, is in the Hawker Centre, which is right on the Thames in North Kingston. Uh -huh. it's, uh, it's now YMCA, but that's the that's the um, that's the social club of the factory, and there's a large housing estate where the factory used to be. But that that's the answer to your question. Really. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm here to obviously to talk about the economy uh, chapter. Uh, in this uh, this excellent book, which is, you know, um, I've, I've only had the economy chapter to read, so I am looking forward to reading the rest of it. Um, but I think actually, um, just before I came into the, the room today, I've been at the at the rally, and I don't know how many of you were there. Um, if you missed it, I understand. Uh, you, missed, <laughs> you missed the cheesy jokes, and you've missed the stunts, you missed some excellent speeches by, by Wendy and by Layla, you missed Josh Babarundi in a wetsuit, maybe you didn't. Um, but you also missed our group leader on uh, Liverpool City Council, Carl Cashman, and he was, uh, and it was a real privilege to meet Carl for the first time uh, this evening. Uh, he's someone who, whose name I've heard and who I've seen, uh, you know, sort of on social media and so on, and someone I've really wanted to meet. And he's a very, very impressive young man, and his speech was about why he's a Liberal Democrat. Now, he's obviously quite different from me. So Liverpool is a long way from Richmond. Uh, he's very much fighting the Labour Party up there in the northwest, whereas I'm all about uh, driving Tories out of Richmond, which is nearly succeeded in doing one um, and, uh, and And his reason for being uh, a Liberal Democrat was very much about the, the Liberal Democrats. We're the party of, of Beveridge, the party of Lloyd George. We are the party of the welfare state. Obviously, uh, Wendy covered that a huge amount in, in, in her speech, but he's kind of like, we can't let Labour own that. We can't let Labour be the party of the welfare state because it is ours and we are the ones uh, who, who brought that into the UK and we are the ones who really champion the idea of a, of a, of a safety net of a 
uh, you know, a, 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 um, a way of thinking about the economy that put people first. And that for me is what is so important. And throughout the, the, the chapter on the economy, I think that's the bit that, that really uh, is, is highlighted in, in, you know, as we look at every step uh, of economic history, uh, of economic liberal history, because for me, the sort of the golden thread, if you like, running through all the different bits is about, it's about markets, as, as Leila mentioned, it's about free trade and that markets is, uh, is, the, is the most liberal form of distribution. It's about individuals trading with each other. It's about people exchanging things of value with each other. Um, and for me, it's, it's the best economic expression of, of liberalism. But what we've always understood is that markets exist to support individuals, communities, and families. They do not exist as an end in themselves. And that for me, is what distinguishes a liberal approach to the economy uh, from the conservatives or, or, a, or a labor approach. It is about the, the use of markets to support individuals, communities, and families. And that's why we recognize that in order to have a free market, in order to have free trade, you need to support equality. You need to have uh, people coming into the market, participating in the market, need to do it on as fair a basis as they possibly can. And that means um, we want to try and equalize uh, people's contribution to markets through uh, supporting their, their health and their well-being. We want to, to support their participation in markets through ensuring everybody has equal access to education. And we want as far as possible to try and boost people's incomes or in, you know, ensure an equalization of income so that people are trading in markets on as fair a basis as possible. And that's what's always supported our approach to the economy. And you can see that, I think, uh, throughout our history. And I think it's really, really striking when you look back, particularly on the 20th century, and you think about the major economic uh, changes, or the, 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 perhaps if you like, the evolution of the economy throughout the 20th century. Uh, and just to go back to, to Carl's speech earlier on, it is the Liberals, and it is the Liberal Democrats who have really pushed forward those changes. Lloyd George first in, in 1906, uh, John Maynard Keynes, who has uh, a central part of this particular chapter, and how Keynes is probably right up there as being the most influential economic thinker, at least of the first half of the 20th century, if not the whole of the 20th century. And he developed his ideas within a liberal framework. And then uh, again, as Carl uh, was, was saying earlier on, uh, Beveridge um, and, Han and his ideas and, and the work that he did uh, to, to found uh, the, the post-war welfare state, but not just, not just the welfare state in terms of, of benefits, but also the National Health Service, because we need uh, to support people's health in order to ensure that they are able to participate as fully as they possibly can in the economy. So for me, that's, as I say, the, the, the golden thread. It's about uh, maintaining an economy to support people, um, families and communities. And I think um, probably my last point would be about, um, as we reflect on our most recent uh, period of political history, um, and obviously, uh, the referendum and Brexit loom very large. And when I think about why it mattered so much to Liberal Democrats to fight and fight so hard to remain in the European Union, is we were fighting for the rights of individuals to be in a it, to be in the single market as much as anything else. That that people in the UK could trade with people in France, with people in in Belgium, with people in Spain, and we could trade freely as individuals. We don't need to go. We don't need to have the permission of our government to trade with people in other nations. And that for us was the key liberal idea that we really wanted to preserve above all else. We are individuals and we are organizations and we want to speak directly and trade directly to people in other countries. And that more than anything is what the conservatives have taken away from us. They have made us uh, you know, transact our our, uh, our our economic transactions through the medium of the government now, uh, you know, through the medium of, of uh, customs and customs forms and tariffs and, and the other, you know, regulatory uh, burdens that they have placed upon uh, British uh, businesses. Uh, and that, I think, is the key thing that we've lost, the, uh, the ability to, to trade, to transact as individuals, whether it's as, uh, you know, financial transactions or, or a transaction in ideas, uh, that's the thing that the Conservatives have taken away from us. And that, I think, more than anything, is why Brexit was such an affront and continues to be such an affront to Liberal Democrats. So I think I will 
finish there. Uh, but thank you very much. It's been a really, really good session. Thank you. There are mics to come round before you ask questions. First, I'd just like to ask Duncan Wack uh, on behalf of the Liberal Democrat History Group to say one or two words. Thanks very much, William. So my name is Duncan Brack. I'm the editor of the Journal of Liberal History. And uh, I just want to say a few words about what the History Group does. We were set up when this party was founded <clears throat> in 1988 uh, with the mission of uh, promoting the discussion and research of the history of the Liberal Party and the SDP, and now, of course, the Liberal Democrats. We have 30 years of history of our own. Um, <clears throat> and we do this in four main ways. We organize meetings like this one. I can tell you the next meeting we're planning is on the 29th of January, hopefully in the National Liberal Club in London, but it'll be hybrid, it'll be online as well. Uh, and we are looking at the Irish famine of the 1840s mm -hmm. and the challenges faced by Lord John Russell's Whig Liberal government in responding to it. Mm -hmm. And then the fringe meeting uh, at the spring conference in March, we are going to look at another one of the chapters in this book about the Liberal Party's record and Liberal Democrats record on the environment and how that uh, how we emerged as the greenest of the main three main parties. Uh, we uh, also publish the Journal of Liberal History, our flagship publication. This is the latest issue just out this week. Um, its main article is about Gladstone and slavery, and you can read what Gladstone really said and thought about slavery, which is a bit different from what you might have read in the papers about what he <laughs> thought. Uh, and we also have an article by John Curtis, uh, on the analysing the Dem performance in the local elections this year. So you can see the kind of range of articles that we have and book reviews and meeting reports and so on. We maintain a website at liberalhistory.org.uk and we publish, of course, a range of booklets and uh, larger books. And we also sell some books from larger uh, mainstream publishers. You can see all that at our exhibition stand in the uh, exhibition in the hall. Please come and talk to us. Uh, but of course, the main purpose of this meeting is to launch this booklet, our latest one, um, 10 chapters on different topics. We've looked at four of them this evening. We also have an introduction and a detailed timeline. Uh, it is available for a mere £7.50, um, but if you're a journal subscriber, you get it for £6, and it's a special offer just for this meeting only. Anyone can buy it for £6. Mm -hmm. So my colleague Tony will sell you it after the meeting finishes uh, of the design. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Yes, so let's start there. We can. Hi, Dean from Bedford. Um, you mentioned a lot about the welfare state and the need in terms of whether you go reaching the NHS and everything else. Um, what's the panel's view on getting back to making national insurance and insurance contribution <laughs> system a core of our policy? Because there's many people put off at the moment with claiming national insurance benefits because they're just taken away by universal credit. So it may allow us to actually regain the welfare state argument about a contribution made a better benefit system. Um, and that was William Bedford's intention in the first place. So what are the kind of views on that? Uh, well, I've got two, but choose which one you want to ask. I mean, one, 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 one is... Um, can, can you stand up? Sorry, and, sorry. Okay. Yes, sorry, everyone at the back can okay. hear you. Yeah, okay. So I have two, but you can choose which one you want to you, you want to answer. Um, I, uh, the, the first is: um, Is it useful and important for us to talk more about our history uh, in, in in our messaging? Um, and, and and the second is: um, Is it important now what we say about the coalition and how we we start to talk about that? You know, it is now history, and uh, um, I'm I'm just interested in in, in what we think about how important that is. Thank you. Wendy, yeah, you don't start with yeah, well, um, now have all this is on the I really what much. Um, I, I think it I think it is interesting how we have ended up and, and it's it's interesting for me as a Scottish MP if I think about the, the ongoing argument in relation to pensions and in independent Scotland, where um the SNP have been frankly economically incoherent. But part of that is because I think there are a lot of um not misunderstandings, but the nature of the welfare state has changed in, in the way that you said that that uh, it does get to a position where when we think about pensions, people think that they put into a pot and the reality is there's no pot exists. The pot that we are paying into is paying existing pensions and we hope that the pension, the, the, the contributions of the future will be our pensions when, when it comes to that. So I think actually it's it's less about what 
you're talking about relations national issues, but I'm more than happy to go away and have a discussion and think about that within our DWP cluster, but more about the complexities that exist within uh, the welfare system currently and how poor the DWP is at delivering against that and how people who come into contact with that system, if I think back again to 2020, found it incredibly difficult to navigate and challenge. I mean, I don't know what, what, what Sarah and, and Leila think, but, but my view is, is that if everything worked in government the way it's supposed to, I wouldn't need to employ any caseworkers. Mm -hmm. Basically, my, my job, or our job comes into being when the system doesn't work and things go wrong. And so I know that you know the volume that I have in terms of casework in relation to DWP, PIP, work capability assessments, a child maintenance system, we should forget that that's part of the system as well, is when those you know people basically cannot navigate those systems uh, without, without support, whether that comes from systems advice or whether it comes from going to MP. So I think the complexity of DWP and as a department, I think there are issues around how big it is and the, the lack of control actually it has in relation to treasury acts, aspects such as HMRC is actually the root cause of, of some of the issues around uh, our welfare state. But as I say, happy to pick up afterwards and, and take, uh, take your suggestion away. Yes. Um, uh, on the question about talking about the coalition, uh, the, the answer to your question is yes and no. It's ten years since the. it's by what? It's ten years since we since the same sex marriage thing went through. I went to an anniversary uh, event of that. Do you know that the Tories did that all on their own, yeah. and we had nothing to do with yeah. it whatsoever? Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah. important that we talk about the coalition so that those bastards don't steal things that were good about it and write us out of history. But I also, at the moment, quite like the fact that in the media, they talk about the Tories having been in power for all the time, not us. Yeah, and I yeah, don't yeah. want us, I don't want us going, being soldered back into, mm. frankly, some of the bad bits of coalition. We were the junior partners, we had to do things we did not like. We don't want to be talking up any, and, get, and feeling any of the stupid ideas about coalition in the future. So yes, by all means, talk about it. But be very careful how you choose to talk about it. But do make sure that you don't let the Labour and the Tories write the real write the history of the coalition. Yeah. Um, I, I will absolutely endorse what you say. And um, I just I I couldn't contain myself when David Cameron started tweeting about how proud he was to push that through. I couldn't stop myself. I was like, oh no, you don't get to do that. Um, so yeah, absolutely. There are there are elements from that period that we should be proud of. And I have to say, it's becoming easier and easier to make the case for what we also stopped, given the way the Conservative Party have now governed in the last few years. It is very clear the elements that have now taken over that party that we were inherent in stopping. And so that argument is getting much easier. The other thing to relay from, you know, lots of students in my seat, um, they, they don't really remember the tuition fee stuff. <laughs> Um, the people who remember are older, yeah. and there is still a problem there. Parents, absolutely, absolutely, parents, parents and mm -hmm. and and they're older. But in terms of young people, and I, uh, there is now this opportunity to start talking to young people again. And, you know, that space is opening up, and I, I hope we embrace that. Um, but to the talking to our history bit, I mean, again, horses for courses, but it is very very helpful to be able to stand up in Parliament and say. You know, it was the Liberals that did X, Y, Z. It, it, it really gives so much more gravitas. And that is something that as a smaller party, you can sometimes not have. You can be seen as, you know, well, what's the point of you? And that's the question you often get, or you'll get a journalist asking, well, what's the point of the Liberal Democrat? Well, actually, a piece that we should, I think, reach more into is our history and what we have, have achieved over you know, hundreds of years. Um, we are still very much of that tradition. We are the Liberal Party of the United Kingdom. And much as we offered a lot in the past, we've got a lot to offer for the future. So I do think it's maybe not the first thing you go to on the door, but <laughs> certainly something that I think we should reach for if needed, uh, and we could do it more. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't got a huge amount more to add to that, but just to pick up on Leila's point about um, our, our, our history and our, our traditions and, you know, and how far back the uh, liberal tradition does stretch and indeed how much it's achieved. Um, because I think um, there's people are used to thinking of uh, the Liberal Democrats as the kind of 
um, or, you know, I guess also rams or kind of like slightly insignificant or, you know, not not as important as, as, as Labour and Conservative. And I think I think particularly where we're fighting the Tories and there's, you know, the Tories love to think that they are the natural party of government, that they, you know, sweep the, you know, most of the, most of the country. Um, and my, my predecessor in Richmond Park, Susan Kramer, said the trouble with the Tories is they think they are Britain. Uh, and that, you know, everybody else is some kind of, you know, insurgent interloper, you know, <laughs> they're just, they're, you know, it's not really, uh, they're not really entitled to be there. And that's why I think it's really important that we can, you know, talk about, you know, Gladstone and Lloyd George and, you know, all of that, that history. You know, we have just as much right as the Conservatives do uh, to be in the House of Commons, to you know, um, to, to wield power and, and the laws, I think it's uh, <laughs> to wield power to, you know, to, to, to be in government. And I, actually, I do think, and as somebody who didn't join the Liberal Democrats until 2015, like, like Wendy, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm obviously talking from, from Richmond, which is perhaps quite specific, but people actually, with the perspective of uh, the Conservatives being in government by themselves and the absolute horlicks that they've made of it, people look back quite fondly on the coalition and it's like there were sensible people there. There were people who had a you know real sense of what they wanted to achieve, a real sense of purpose. And when they got into government, they did something about achieving the things that were important to them. And that has been so lacking ever since that I think people actually do have, whatever they might have thought at the time of you know, the specific policies, a sense that you know we were a party uh, with values and that that's what we still represent uh, and that you know actually people are prepared to, to look again at the Liberal Democrats and remember what we did in the coalition with perhaps more fondness than they might have done in 2015. So the, the Lords is a very odd place. I, I, when I first entered uh, just before they got rid of most of the entities, we had Conrad Russell who was our past president of this group uh, on our front bench the Earl Russell um, and the uh, leader of the House when the Conservative government was just in its final days in 1996-7 uh, was uh, the son of the Marquis of, of Salisbury. And Conrad summed up at the end of a, a very powerful speech from our benches by saying to uh, the leader of the House, and as my great-grandfather <laughs> said to your great-grandfather, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, a sense of history is sometimes like, like, <laughs> and, and our newest recruit is now John Russell, Conrad's son. Uh, uh, which I'm with two more questions. Or, yes, uh, one the one furthest at the back at the first. <laughs> uh, Jefferson Horsley. Uh, oh, it's my son. Jefferson Horsley. Um, very interested in this, but can I ask the panel to consider this? I think we have to learn from history. The first thing I want to say is you've now offered that book for six pounds and I paid seven fifty pounds. I'm going to come and demand my refund of one pound since I bought it from the stand uh, only about three hours ago. <laughs> But more importantly, can I come to the question of uh, trade and the is there a danger, is there a dichotomy from the fact that, um, from my knowledge of economics, uh, etc., uh, which is getting a bit rusty now, although I did have a degree in it at one time, um, the fact that power and trading um, concentrates into pure and pure hands. And therefore, and you know, it's, we can witness it um, from the news only yesterday that Lachlan, whatever his name is, um, Murdoch is taking over from his father. And um, that is going to, in my view, sort of maintain that pressure. And if Economies and then you've got um, other references uh, along those same lines. And you know, um, you can recall the days of things like conglomerates, um, you know, where in fact you were purchasing companies that actually had no 
relationship whatsoever to each other, other than the fact that you can monopolize. <laughs> so could they perhaps express their views? Do they see any danger in, in that occurring, which might undermine our our, our faith in um, in markets? In, in markets. Thank you. And there's a, yes. And the Hi, Al Buffalo, convener of the John Stuart Mill Institute. Could I make an initial point, which is that John Stuart Mill, in his autobiography, gave a fulsome credit to Harriet Taylor for her influence and indeed sharing the authorship of his great work on liberty. And I don't think any can take away from that. Secondly, I think we need to try and retrain Adam Smith as a liberal, not conservative. He believed in markets, but he assumed that the actors in markets would be, their behavior would be infused by a Christian morality. And that is an assumption that cannot hold in the present day. And we need to think about the degree of regulation that is required to ensure free and fair trading uh, without the concentrations of power that Jefferson has just referred to. Thirdly, a uh, point about the beverage report. When it was published in 1942, did the Labour Party support it? <laughs> no, it didn't. It thought it was too radical and too expensive. The beverage report uh, as a document was on sale to the public and was a bestseller. Mm -hmm. And it was only the pressure of liberals and others fighting as in by-elections as independents against the uh, people like Honor Balfour, for example, against the coalition and against Labour, uh, uh, and the public pressure that persuaded the Labour Party they needed to take a more radical approach. And, you know, it's the, it's the um, timidity of the Labour Party that still, that we need to go for it. <laughs> Alan, yeah. there's a comment about the friend. Can I take Martin? Can we have a Then we'll have a go back to the panel. Thanks, Martin Horwood. Um, actually, my question was quite similar to the first one then, which is on the economic theme. And to just draw on that um, historic tradition, especially in North American and progressive liberalism there, of trust busting, of confronting monopoly, um, both private monopolies in that era, which is probably most relevant now, but also, of course, state monopoly, which makes it a difficult one for the Labour Party to adopt. Um, I just wondered if Sarah thought that was, you know, had resonance now. And um, if you want, also to offer an even longer running historic liberal campaign. How about abolition of the House of Lords? Um thanks. I think um I think what uh that all three of those uh questions slash comments uh slightly highlight is 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 that really what um a liberal approach to the economy is about is ensuring the widest possible participation in our economy mm -hmm. in markets. Um, and to the, the furthest extent possible to supporting, uh, you know, or, or to, ad to addressing the causes of inequality to ensure that people can, uh, can contribute uh, uh, equally uh, as, as much as possible. And I think that's where uh, you've mentioned the Murdoch's, Rupert Murdoch is my constituent. Yes, my my constituent and his son. Uh, <laughs> that, 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 I mean, that's obviously, and, and I mean, you've you've highlighted very well, kind of like that's why uh, that that's why. It's, it's against the liberal tradition to have one person accumulating too much power in one specific market. It, it squeezes competition. And as soon as you start to squeeze competition, uh, you start to exclude people. Uh, obviously, there's, there's the, the, the kind of like the basic effect of, of prices rise and that itself is, uh, excludes people. It reduces choice. Uh, and we're seeing that not just in the media market at the moment, but 
in all sorts of places. The housing market, I think, is probably, certainly in London, you know, the, the, the best example of that. There is so little available for sale or for rent that the, 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 the prices go up. And, and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are not free to exercise a choice about where they live or how they live because, uh, because of the way the housing market uh, is currently operating in London. So I think it really just, just kind of, I suppose, all of those comments and Martin's comment at the end there about monopolies, um, it, you know, a, again, you know, doing everything possible to kind of break up monopolies or, or oligopolies and to make, again, it's about the widest possible participation. And I think the role of government is to, uh, is to support that uh, and support individuals within the market. But then, you know, once people are allowed and enabled to participate in the market, to then let the market distribute its its resources the way people want it to. Uh, and that, for me, is, is the most important thing. Thank you. Um, Labour voters will be against the service report. I'll be using that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. And you should hear how they harp on about it in, in Parliament. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I thought I might just comment on the um, danger aspect because, of course, you know, markets now are just completely across the world. And there is a move to more protectionist markets. Uh, the CHIP Act in America being uh, a really good example. The EU has its answer to that. And I worry about the rhetoric with China, for example, being seen as us being anti-free trade, but it's not. Because there's an element to free trade that I think is incredibly important. And I think it's it's been drawn out in some of the conversations so far. Free trade itself is agnostic. And so you have to put your values on it to make it make sense for our communities and our countries. And without, maybe that's what was meant by the sort of Christian ideal or whatever it is, you know, I would interpret that as, you can have free markets, but you also must have values. And when we talk as liberals about trade across the world, we also, in the same breath, talk about human rights. It is entirely congruent to want to trade with other countries and hold them to account for our values, because ultimately their goods will be coming to our country and we're not going to buy at any price. So in trade agreements, it is right that we push for human rights clauses, for uh, clauses that you know, protect. Uh, one of the things that we passed long ago in our party's policy is we want a ban on settlement goods coming out of Palestine. Um, that doesn't mean we don't want to trade with Israel. We do. But we also recognize that there are limits to that trade. And if they are going to be selling things out of occupied territory, then that shouldn't be something that we should support as a country. So where we are in terms of trade internationally is that we do default to free trade, but not at any price. We bring our values with us. And I would put to you that that is a key difference between us and the Tories who seem just to not care. Right. Yeah, just, just very briefly on the points, I, I entirely agree with, with uh, Leila, it is about values that you put on it, and one of the things that I was certainly thinking about there was the reflections in relation to, uh, you know, apartheid South Africa and the boycott mm -hmm. uh, that took place, particularly when you're talking about settlements, so it is about uh, letting, letting the market. The bits I wanted to talk about was timidity of labour, and I did note in the welfare chapter that the Scottish Liberal Fe Foundation, uh, Liberal Federation were the first to support the beverage report, so I think I'll be remembering to, to mention that. <laughs> labour timidity and yeah, labour timidity is interesting because you know uh, Sarah was making a comment about um, the Conservatives seeing themselves as Britain. They're seen as us in that party, but with the failure of the Labour Party to look seriously at electoral reform, or the failure of the Labour Party leadership to look seriously at electoral reform, they are basically settling for being in the government a third of the time, mm -hmm. and that is the real the, the real disappointment for me in terms of Labour, they're willing to settle for that as opposed to potentially locking the Conservatives out and making uh, the changes and deliveries uh, aligned with uh, more aligned with Liberal values uh, that, that I, want, I want to see. So I think that 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 for me is, is one of the key challenges. And then just to comment briefly on the House of Lords and, and uh, conscious of, uh, of sharing the stage here with uh, my noble uh, uh, Lords. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think we've had a clear policy on this uh, for some time. 
but what I have accepted uh, more recently, and this is the short time that I was constitutional reform spokes uh, with uh, William and, and Paul Tyler's uh, support, is around the fact that we have reshaped um, and, and updated and modernised our, our, our federalism uh, approach. And, and I love when I'm in Scotland, or when I'm living indoors, and I get you know, the challenge, and I love talking about uh, federalism. And I have actually had a couple of people say, Oh, yeah, I would, I would accept federalism instead of independence, marvellous. But <laughs> I do think we've got into a situation where our policy in relation to the House of Lords is where we've got to in federalism, particularly our most recent paper around what that would look like from an English perspective, means we're slightly out of kilter in that when we talk about a fully elected House of Lords, we're not necessarily re recognising the regional aspects mm -hmm. of our federal policy. So I think it's potentially maybe uh, not for, because maybe we shouldn't be talking about this at length in our manifesto or pre-manifesto, <laughs> but I do think we need to think about, you know, what seriously that would look like, particularly when, if we are looking at a change of government after the next election, that's clearly where Labour are going to focus on over electoral reform, so we need to make sure that we properly input to that. Mm. Um, I take you back to the point where I started. I started with Mary Walton Carter. I, I started with access of women to education. And we forget, uh, we, when we talk about beverage and all of that, we forget that one of the five giants was, was, was ignorance. Oh, yes, and yeah. I think that access to education yeah. and skills and, and, and information and reliable information as opposed to false, false facts mm -hmm. and all of that, that is going to be one of the key areas uh, in the future that will be uh, very, very important in terms of um, in the age when we have, we don't yet have a Zuckerberg dynasty, but it might be on the plan. Will we, will, yeah, it is going to be crucial because equipping young people to be inventive and is, is a key part of opening all of this, keeping keeping all of it uh, open uh, in the future. Uh, on the House of Lords, well, you know, I never expected to be there. I said when I went in that I would vote for the abolition of it, and I always have. Uh, for the moment, while I'm there, I um, use my position thoroughly. Um, and actually, the only excuse I think for the current House of Lords is that those of us who happen to be there um, have an obligation to speak up for the people who don't have a voice. Mm -hmm. You know, drug addicts, people with mental health uh, problems, asylum seekers, all the people that the Daily Mail hate. <laughs> they are the people that we have to, because they can't get at ours. Uh, they really can't. Um, and it, I'm not. I'm not one of those people. You know, I'm so astonished by the number of critics of the House of Lords, and they, their backside hits their red benches. <laughs> oh, they do not. Oh, do they not? <laughs> <laughs> but I think that there has got to be a place in our politics where minorities and others and outsiders somehow get a voice. Now, weirdly, at the moment. That happens to be more yeah. in the House of Lords. Yeah. Yeah. That is not a reason to keep us mm -hmm. unreformed. Mm -hmm. But give us a break, why don't you? <laughs> the second book that I borrowed from the House of Commons Library was Ian Dunn's uh, How Westminster Works and, and Why It Doesn't. And actually, he's full of praise for the House of Lords because he believes it's actually the only part of Parliament that currently is delivered with scrutiny. And the fact that we have a quieter day on Monday, Tuesday this week is a testament to that because simply the government had scheduled time before conference recess, expecting us to have lots of legislation come back from the Lords. And it didn't because they're still scrutinising it. <laughs> Sarah needs to, to go to catch a train. Um, <laughs> uh, may I abuse the chair just a little bit, Martin, by saying I would, I, you may remember, I was, I was the coalition minister who was supposed to take reform mm -hmm. through the House of Lords. But on one occasion, I've lost my temper on winding up the debate. <laughs> it's really difficult. We did try. Um, we need a second chamber at the present moment yeah. because. The Commons does not scrutinise legislation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And the reason why in this session the House of Lords has sat for longer hours each week than the Commons That's right. is because we are scrutinising legislation and the Commons has almost given up. Yeah, but we also don't have control of the we don't so you have don't control, have control, control yes. of time. The government is the control of time. So if they schedule a day for a second reading, that's how long it takes. Yes. And I, I have had some some Schadenfreude type of enjoyment, uh, watching ministers thinking they were going to carry uh, bills through the Lords 
and then coming up against ex conservative ministers, yeah. cross benches, <laughs> people on our benches, and Labour who unpick the nonsense which was inside these bills. Uh, the leveling up bill took, I think, a day on the fourth and third reading, yes, in, which is pretty uh, standard. Commons. And yeah. if you add in urgent questions, ministerial uh, statements a day, probably three hours. The Connect family will know <laughs> it's taken seven long days in the Lords going on to past 10 o'clock at night, and we have unpicked it quite a lot. Thank and you. it will now come <laughs> back uh, and forth. So somehow, Mm. Parliament needs reforming, yeah, yeah. the Commons as much as the Lords, yeah. mm. uh, and we probably need a federal second chamber. When I hoped that I would be appointed, when I was appointed, that after a while I would stand for Yorkshire in the second <laughs> chamber. <laughs> <laughs> um, 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 I think we probably now ought to put it to a close. Thank you very much indeed. And I would particularly like to thank the gentleman about his kind donation. I hope we will. Can I ask, have we made history this evening by being the first all female panel at Liberal History? Yeah. 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 You're, you're all welcome at uh, uh, Liberal Democrat History Group meetings. Do uh, contribute to the magazine. We're always looking for uh, interesting thoughts, for uh, contributions to the journal. Many of you know bits of local history uh, that would be uh, quite useful to have. And I must say, I've been sitting here thinking that I probably ought to try to research and contribute to history on Bradford liberalism and the role of Titus Salt, who was three times mayor of Bradford, then became an MP and actually didn't like it. <laughs> so gave way to somebody called W.E. Forster, uh, who had a role in education, uh, which was a very important part of educating uh, the skilled working classes in the 19th century against a lot of conservative opposition. So uh, there's a lot more to cover in history, but uh, do uh, buy this uh, uh, pamphlet, uh, there's plenty more to read, and any contributions you may like to have towards extending Liberal Democrat uh, history will be welcomed by the editors and by other members of the group. Thank you to our panel, you were superb, uh, and I'm, I, I had not remarked that I was the only mayor here, but that's entirely appropriate. <laughs> As you know, we, have, we are the first parliamentary party in the Commons to have a clear majority of women, uh, and let us hope that the majority of women grows further uh, at the end after the mid-bench by <laughs> <laughs>